Welcome to Trial Site News podcast series. We recently published a story on trialsitenews.com about a clinical trial conducted by Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis, which evidences the, the potential that fluvoxamine, an antidepressant, may prevent COVID-19 infections from worsening. Now, this trial is based on recent research that originates from the University of Virginia School of Medicine. And so joining us today to talk about this is Dr. Lenz, who is the Wallace and Lucille Renard Professor of Psychiatry and the director of the Healthy Mind Lab at Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis, Missouri. Now, Dr. Lenz is a clinical trialist who has successfully advanced evidence-based medicine for depression, anxiety, and cognitive disorders in older adults. And in a series of successful and ongoing clinical trials, he has tested the benefits and risks of antidepressants, describing mindfulness, cognitive behavioral therapy, and exercise. So, Dr. Welcome. Thank you. The pleasure is ours. So, how did you get involved with research? So, uh, gosh, that, that goes way back. I've been involved in research, I guess, since uh, college, but it didn't really pick up uh, for me until I was a psychiatry resident. And uh, uh, then um, that was in the mid 1990s. And then I moved to University of Pittsburgh and really uh, started to do clinical trial research there and really fell in love with it. And that's what I've been doing ever since. Now we hear at trial site news we hear from a lot of physicians that there needs to be more research focused on early stage treatment of COVID 19. now we were glad to hear that this study appeared to be moving along with a positive path could you share with our network what the implication is of the potential for early onset treatment of COVID 19 should a safe and effective drug be found well it's it's uh we're talking at the end of december to uh uh, 2020, when uh, we all know that the hospitals around the country are uh, filling or filled up with cases of COVID, and uh, there's an incredible uh, amount of mortality. I, I think over 3,000 people died uh, yesterday. And uh, a lot of what's going on is people with initially mild symptoms uh, in the first several days or week of the illness. Uh, for reasons that are still not fully understand, develop more uh, serious illness often in the second week of, it, uh, of the illness. Uh, they develop lung damage, they have uh, trouble breathing, they end up in the hospital uh, often on a ventilator. Uh, and I think uh, this is still going on, obviously, one year into the pandemic. And uh, if there were an early treatment, something that you could start taking while you're still having just mild symptoms that would prevent you from getting that serious illness, uh, it could have a huge impact on the pandemic, on reducing those hospitalizations and mortality. And that's what's motivated us all along. Right. Now, I want to talk then about fluvoxamine. So this study was based initially on some research from University of uh, Veterans Affairs School of Medicine. They conducted a small study. Is this the case? And could you elaborate on the results? Yes. Yeah, so that was a study uh, uh, done in a, with a basic science lab, meaning uh, it was a study done in uh, mice, actually, where they uh, tested uh, fluvoxamine's ability to prevent deterioration and death in sepsis. Now, sepsis is a very serious condition that sometimes occurs uh, in the context of an infection uh, or after surgery. Uh, it makes people critically ill and people often die from it. And it's thought to be due to a hyperactive immune response uh, of the uh, body. Uh, and uh, in this study published last year, uh, these investigators showed that fluvoxamine was able to prevent that uh, deterioration and mortality. Uh, and that's what motivated us to say, uh, could we use this in COVID uh, to prevent the deterioration uh, that often occurs? Now, now, this drug has been around for at least a couple of decades. Could you expand on what a drug like fluvoxamine can do and why it may show promise? Yeah, so uh, one, of the, one of the promising th things about uh, fluvoxamine is precisely that. It's been around a long time 
And so what that means uh, is it, it's already FDA approved. It's already been used in uh, millions of people. Uh, we know about its safety. We know about its tolerability. As well, it's widely available. It's very easy to use, right? It's just a pill that you take. Uh, and uh, e even more so uh, because it's been around long enough that it's no longer under patent protection, it's inexpensive. So from those very pragmatic aspects, it would be an ideal treatment uh, for early COVID. Uh, what uh, prompted us to look at fluvoxamine specifically uh, was its effects on what's called the sigma-1 receptor. Uh, this is a, a, a receptor in the body that uh, regulates inflammation, regulates our immune response. Importantly, what it doesn't, it doesn't shut down inflammation altogether. So it doesn't shut down our immune response, uh, but it uh, regulates, dampens a hyperactive immune response. That's what the researchers uh, at University of Virginia showed last year. Uh, and we thought it was for that specific reason that it could be uh, used uh, against COVID. Could you share with our audience how this study is coming along? So we conducted uh, the first uh, clinical trial and that study was completed uh, and the results were published uh, in the Journal of the American uh, Medical Association in November. In that study, which was uh, a small or phase two uh, clinical trial, um, we gave uh, fluvoxamine or placebo to 152 people who were er with early mild COVID. Uh, of the people who got placebo, 8% deteriorated. They developed uh, uh, hypoxia uh, and uh, many were hospitalized. Uh, as a result. In the fluvoxamine group, none did, zero did. Oh, wow. So that was a very promising finding. It's what we would call statistically significant, meaning that the results were un uh, unlikely due to chance. Uh, but it was also not only a small study, but the first study of its kind, right? The first uh, clinical trial uh, of fluvoxamine in COVID. So, um, the, when we published it, the scientific community's uh, response was, this is really promising, but it needs to be uh, replicated. And I agree, agree with that. The, uh, you know, part of the essence of science is replication. Uh, and, you know, we, we, in this country, we don't approve drugs based on a single clinical trial result. Um, right. So uh, when we published this first study, we knew that uh, the burden was uh, there to replicate the findings. So uh, we have right now, we just started last week uh, recruiting for uh, a new larger study to replicate our results. Now, for those that might be interested in being involved with this, you mentioned recruiting, how would they go about contacting you guys? That, that's a, a great question, and I just I want to make make a point that one of the uh, one of the things that uh, we did for this uh, for the first clinical trial and this new one was to make it as easy as possible, as low burden as possible, for patients to participate in the trial. Uh, I think people often think of clinical trials as these really onerous. Uh, uh, maybe kind of mysterious things to uh, participate in. And unfortunately, as a result of that, uh, um, you know, very, very few people with COVID in this country have participated in clinical trials. Um, maybe because they haven't heard about it, or maybe just because, uh, you know, they, they weren't near a clinical trial site, or it was just too much uh, burden uh, to participate on top of dealing with the illness itself. So realizing that what we're doing is what's called a fully remote or at-home clinical trial. That means instead of uh, you, the patient, having to come to us, we take the clinical trial to you. Uh, anyone, any, anywhere in the 50 states uh, in the US, uh, and in fact, we're actually uh, cooperating with a group in Canada who will be doing this study there as well. Anyone anywhere can participate from their home. Uh, if you're eligible, 
uh, uh, go to our uh, you can go to our website, see if you're eligible. If you're interested, we'll contact you. We'll take you through the consent process, and then we will either courier or ship all the study supplies, including medication, to you. Uh, and then it's a simple matter of taking the study medication and filling out a survey every day uh, for for about two weeks. So we really we really des designed this trial with patients in mind who, uh, you know, they're 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 dealing with an illness. They're dealing with like you said, you're dealing with a lot of things. The last thing they want to deal with is uh, leaving their house and going off to some uh, medical site to get uh, to uh, for a clinical trial. Um, the best the best way to find out about it is to go to our website. Uh, it's stop COVID trial. Well, that's all one word at Wustl, which is W-U-S-T-L dot E-D-U. Um, I think if you just type the words uh, stop COVID trial into a uh, search engine like Google, you'll find it as well. Um, people can also call us at our uh, uh, study number, which is area code 314-747-1137. Uh, uh, but I think I, for most people who have internet uh, going to the study website is the simplest thing to do. Yeah, and, and we'll provide contact links in our description below as well. So let, let's let's shift this then uh, to what happens next for the NIH. What do you think would need to occur for for this for this trial and this drug to get more attention from that organization? Oh well, so I, I mean, I look at the NIH as. Uh, chiefly a funding organization, an organization that funds uh, individual uh, scientists' careers as well as research projects. And uh, while the NIH is not, at least not at this time, funding this particular project, uh, uh, they funded me throughout my, my career. And I, I, I can guarantee that I would not be here, uh, nor would we be doing this study without the, the support from the NIH. Uh, I think that uh, my hope is that if our, our new study is positive, it'll foster a lot of interest at the NIH as well as uh, uh, other uh, organizations um, such as the FDA uh, to, uh, you know, uh, promote and authorize this uh, treatment for COVID. But I, again, it, I don't want to put the cart before the horse here. It really depends on the results of this new trial. If the new study is positive, then great. We've got a we've got an effective uh, treatment. So now, speaking of funding, is the pharma company that originally created the drug are they involved in any way? No, there's no uh, uh, drug company funding for this study. You know, this is precisely precisely the catch twenty two of repurposing generic drugs. Uh, they're, they've been around a long time and they're very inexpensive, but that also means no one's going to make any money off of them <laughs> if they're proven effective for uh, a new indication like COVID. So there's, uh, so there's zero profit incentive for a, uh, you know, a, a drug company in this case. Uh, and so, you know, the, the, uh, the story of how we've been, uh, doing this research is really, uh, you, you know, kind of this, uh, this cash, uh, cash poor story of we started out with a small internal grant, uh, and then at, at uh, some point in I think around May, uh, the, the study was about halfway done, but we were out of money. Unfortunately, uh, I read I was reading the New York Times that uh, that uh, then, and there was an article about uh, early treatment of COVID that mentioned this uh, fund called the COVID Early Treatment Fund. Uh, so, so I clicked on the link there in the paper and, uh, and uh, applied for funding and actually got a call from the, from the uh, funds organizer, Steve Kirsch, uh, literally within the hour. And then at some point after that, we received uh, about $60,000 of funding from them, oh, which wow. was Probably doesn't sound like a whole lot, but it was enough for us to get that first study done. Uh, and then the COVID early treatment fund has also been a 
a partner uh, in this new trial as well, as have some other uh, private organizations. Uh, one is Fast Grants, and the, the other uh, is the Skoll Foundation. So we, we, we are thankful that uh, of the opportunity for uh, for these funds. Without without that, we, we couldn't do these studies. So let's, I want to, for our audience's uh, edification, could you talk about the Washington University School of Medicine? And it is one of the top research centers in the world. Can you share with our audience the benefits of association with such an institution? Right. Uh, yeah. So I, so I trained here a, a long time ago <laughs> and then uh, moved back here uh, uh, somewhat later in my uh, career. Um, I think WashU is known um, uh, mainly for one thing. They, they try to hire good people uh, and then foster an environment where those individuals can work together and collaborate. Um, and uh, I think this is a really a, a, a story about that. Uh, myself and uh, my uh, 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 co-principal investigator, Angela Ryerson, we're two psychiatrists, uh, and then we uh, reached out to an infectious disease faculty at WashU, and the, uh, de together developed this idea and this, uh, and uh, developed and ran this uh, clinical trial, and now this new study. I mean, the idea that a couple of psychiatrists could go take on COVID is is, you know, I just I. I, it's hard for me to imagine that happening in any other institution. So I give WashU a lot of credit for fostering these kinds of uh, collaborations. Well, Dr. Lenz, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to speak with us. We greatly appreciate you doing so. Well, thank you as well.